So the long-standing model to evaluate medicine or therapeutics has been evidence-based medicine. And what that usually means is there's this hierarchy, the types of studies that you're doing to evaluate drug X. Let's say drug X for blood pressure. Um, and typically what you'll notice is the best trials are those that are randomized control trials, double-blinded studies, you know, uh, uh, the practitioner or the doctor and the patients have no clue what, who got what treatment or who's doing what. It's all disconnect and you're trying to make sure there's no bias involved and you're also trying to limit any vari variability. So, and for instance, there's very strict inclusion criteria with these studies where you know, it's people 40 to 60 um, with no pre-existing conditions uh, and this is how we're going to evaluate if this drug works or not. And those have been, been maintained as the high standard. So if you look at a study for you know, drug X, was it a randomized control trial? Was it double-blinded? What did the stats say? You know, what was the inclusion criteria? Was it strict or not? And yes, there's, some, there's certainly values in those sort of studies. Um, it certainly dictated how the pharmaceutical industry has functioned for years and years and years. But now let's think about a complementary practice. Let's think about something like meditation. And if you're trying to evaluate if meditation is good for something, you know, some, some health outcome. How could you really blind you know, those patients or those, the people in your study from doing real meditation versus fake meditation? One, I don't even know if that would be ethically correct, but um, you know, that's very difficult to do um, because it's, an, it's a practice that, you know, that isn't, you can't really fake, <laughs> is what I'm trying to say. Um, uh, secondly, in many cases when people take up, you know, you can certainly take up meditation or mindfulness on your own, but it's always good to have a guide. And so in that case, the practitioner can have a lot to do or have a big influence on how you meditate and how you practice. Um, but if you look at it from an EBM standpoint, you wouldn't want that to happen in your study. You wouldn't want any interaction between the person guiding you in meditation and the people actually practicing it. Um, and then the other part of this is, you know, usually from an EBM or evidence-based standpoint, usually you're looking for one single outcome. It's a very reductionist-based model. You know, did blood pressure decrease, yes or no? That's all we care about, right? But what you have to think about is, you know, are there other things that change for these patients? Was it just blood pressure that you should be looking at? Should you look at maybe the brain and areas of the brain? Should you look at inflammatory markers? Are there other biological markers that change with this practice? Why do we not care about those things? Secondly, you know, why don't we, you know, why is qualitative data not as important? If you just ask the patient, how do you feel? Did you feel better? Shouldn't that matter? Shouldn't that be important to the study? Um, and then, you know, going back to things about inclusion criteria, you know, very often the world doesn't work that way. You know, not, it's not that you're going to run everyone you give to drug is going to be, or you want to give the drug to, is between 30 and 60 and has no pre-existing conditions. Just not the way life works. There's a ton of different variables. Um, and so uh, that, that's what I mean is this model, which has worked for certainly some pharmaceutical drugs over time, this model doesn't really work with these sort of complementary practices. They're, whole, they're inherently different in how their practices and what they're supposed to do or how they're supposed to work. And so what, what you really need is a different model, you know, a different way of looking at these, a different lens. What else can you value from these practices? And that's something where I teach, we call something a whole systems research. And this is where whole systems research would value qualitative data. Or they would value, for instance, you know, if the drug worked for 80% of your, your study participants, you know, and from an EBM standpoint, who cares about the other 20%? We don't care that it didn't work for them. We just know it worked for 80%, we're good to go, right? But from a WSR perspective, you would care about that 20%. Hey, why didn't it work in this 20% of the population? What can we do with this 20% or what can we learn from this 20% to perhaps modify or change or use a different direction? So very often from an EBM standpoint, that 20% is completely dis disregarded. From a whole systems perspective, you'd want to investigate that 20% even more. Um, and that's how you have much more, a much wider range for your ther therapy or, or practice, whatever it is that you're trying to study. There might be a much wider range for it depending on how you implement it. And that's what you could learn, like I said, from that 20%. And so there's, there's just other variables that are valued from a whole systems research perspective. Qualitative data. You know, the patient-practitioner relationship is really important and strongly influences how the patient might feel or how the patient might progress. And again, multiple endpoints. As opposed to looking at sing one single endpoint, why not value multiple endpoints to get a much better picture of how the patient is doing or how the patient is feeling and if they're getting better? And I think you can learn so much more 
from these studies or, or, or value them more by looking at them from a slightly different lens. You know, medicine has changed and evolved so much over the last little while. It's not possible that we can just keep using the exact same model over and over and over again and think it's going to work and fit for everything. It's science. Science changes all the time. Theories in science change all the time. One day something's a long-standing theory, the next, the, next, the next year it could be totally, totally proven wrong and a different theory is in place. So, you know, I think it's really unfortunate that, you know, for some of these complementary practices they get pegged, you know, as being poor or, or invaluable or fluff science or some of these terms just because they don't fit this model. When really what we, what we really need is another model and not to say that this other model, this EBM model, is completely invalid. Perhaps there's a way to bring both elements together. Perhaps there's positives you can look at from the EBM model and positives you can take from this WSR model and bring them together to show you how valuable this study is or how effective this particular therapy is. And so that's one of the things I preach in my class is, you know, let's consider this other model when you're evaluating these therapies before you come to your conclusion if this is a poor study or a weak study.